Firstly, I will explain the cast for this mock trial in Japan. The presiding judge, Mori Yoshiyuki, presiding judge, Intellectual Property High Court. The judges, Sano Shin, judge, Intellectual Property High Court. Kumagai Daisuke, judge, Intellectual Property High Court. The attorney for the plaintiff, Shuriyama Yasufumi, a partner of Anderson, Mori, and Tomotsune. The attorney for the defendant, Sagara Yuriko, a partner of Nakamura and Partners. The technical advisors, Yamaguchi Kazuhiro, Judicial Research Official, Intellectual Property High Court, and Nakajima Tomohiro, Judge, Intellectual Property High Court. The Judicial Research Official, Matsunaga Minoru, Judicial Research Official, Intellectual Property High Court. Serving as narrator will be myself, Tsuno Michinori, Judge of Intellectual Property High Court. Before commencing the mock trial, I will give a brief explanation regarding the technical advisors and the judicial research officials. Firstly, technical advisors are national government officials appointed by the Supreme Court on a part time basis. And include university professors and researchers from public institutions. Their role is to provide explanations regarding specialized and technical items that form the points at issue, based on their expert knowledge and from a fair and impartial standpoint. Judicial research officials are full time national government officials, including patent office appeal examiners and patent attorneys. At the behest of the judge, the role of these officials is to look into the necessary technical items. For this case, two technical advisors and one judicial research official are participating in the trial along with the judges. We will now commence the mock trial. Please refer to slide one. The second date for oral argument will now commence. For this case, after the completion of the first date for oral argument, preparatory proceedings were held, and in an online conference, the authorized judge put in order the points at issue and the evidence regarding infringement, and on the third date for preparatory proceedings, preparatory proceedings were closed. Thus, we will hear a statement regarding the results. Can I understand that being the same as the statements made during preparatory proceedings? Yes, that is correct. Yes, that is correct. Please refer to slide two. I would like to ascertain the points at issue in this case. Is it correct that there is no dispute with the fact that the structure of the defendant's product? Is as per the product description of the defendant's product? There is no dispute. There are two points at issue, the first being that regarding element C of the claim, an FRP thread member that passes through a plurality of through holes, whether it is necessary for the thread member that passes through the plurality of through holes to be a single thread, that is to say, Whether it is necessary for a single thread member to pass through a plurality of through holes, or alternatively, that this is not necessary, and that the structure is also included whereby multiple thread members each pass through one through hole only. The second point of issue is whether infringement under the doctrine of equivalence can be acknowledged in the instance that the defendant's product does not fulfill element C. Do you concur with this? Yes, I concur. 
Yes, I concur. The defendant will not be stating patent invalidity defense. Is that correct? Correct, I will not. Today I would like to hold an explanatory session that will include explanations of technical items and organization of the claims. As you are already aware, technical advisors will participate in today's explanatory session. I would now like to ask the technical advisors, Mr. Yamaguchi and Mr. Nakajima, to briefly introduce themselves. My name is Yamaguchi. Currently, I am engaged in research at IP University principally regarding resins and carbon fibers. My name is Nakajima. Currently, I serve as head of the Institute of Industrial Science, Incorporated Administrative Agency. Previously, I was involved in the development of golf clubs at a sports equipment manufacturer. This explanatory session, as was discussed during the online conferences, will focus on the point of issue regarding whether the product in question falls under the technical scope of the patented invention in question, including under the doctrine of equivalence. We would like to hear the plaintiff's explanation first. The explanatory session is held in order to provide an oral explanation from the parties involved regarding technical items. The session is attended by the judges, judicial research officials, and technical advisors, and begins with each party giving a presentation regarding technical items and points at issue, after which, both parties are questioned by the judges, judicial research officials, and technical advisors, and also question each other. while technical advisors provide explanations regarding technical matters. This explanatory session commenced with a presentation from the plaintiff. Without further ado, the attorney for the plaintiff, Shuriyama Yasufumi, will provide the plaintiff's technical briefing. The invention is an invention regarding a golf club head comprising metallic material and fiber reinforced plastic, that is FRP. Indicated on the left is conventional art. The portion shown in yellow is metallic, while the portion shown in green is FRP. And a golf head comprising these two materials already existed. However, in terms of the bonding method for these two materials, there is no particular divisal involved, and they have simply been bonded with the bonding agent at the bonding portion. However, depending on the kind of metallic material, it is problematic to ensure bonding strength and durability. The invention was designed to address this issue. On the bottom right, there is a diagram described in the patent. There is a plurality of through holes provided in the bonding portion of the metallic outer shell member indicated in yellow. The FRP thread member indicated in red passes through these. Having done so, it bonds to the FRP outer shell member indicated in green. Both the green outer shell member and the red thread member are made of FRP, and so they bond strongly. On the other hand, the red thread member firmly hooks the yellow metallic outer shell member, or in other words, is fastened in the form of hooking. As a result of this, the two outer shell members are strongly bonded. Next, please look at slide 4. This is a comparison of the elements B, C, D of the invention with a diagram of the defendant's product. There is no dispute that the defendant's product fulfills elements A, B, D, E of the invention. And the only dispute is with the fulfillment of element C. 
Element C is the interposing of an FRP thread member, along with adhesive material, between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member. The FRP thread member maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of the through holes and running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member. Please refer to Fig 3 on the lower right. This is an illustration of the sectional view of the bonding portion of the defendant's product. Due to limited space, only four through holes are shown. Each of the strips made of FRP shown in red pass through holes provided on the metallic outer shell member in yellow and are positioned alternately on the inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member and on both sides are interposed, along with adhesive material, between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member. Through a heating process, these strips harden into a crank form. Here, if you look at these five strips as an aggregation, they pass through five holes. Please focus on the wording in element C again. There is no limitation whereby the thread member must be a singular thread. There is also no limitation in the description. Accordingly, the five strips in the defendant's product as an aggregation fulfill the thread member in element C. As such, the defendant's product fulfills all of the elements in the invention and infringes the patent rights of the invention. However, even if, hypothetically speaking, element C of the invention required a singular thread member to pass through a plurality of through holes, it would not change the conclusion of infringement. The reason for this is the doctrine of equivalence. For your better understanding, I will explain as follows. Please refer to slide 5. As you are aware, with regard to infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, the Supreme Court indicated five requirements in the judgment of the ball spline bearing case. Under the first requirement, upon comparing the elements of the invention with the structure of the defendant's product, the elements of the invention that the defendant's product do not fulfill are not an essential part of the invention. An essential part of a patented invention is a characteristic part that constitutes a unique technical idea that is not seen in prior art. In conventional art, there was no particular devising to enhance the bonding strength of differing materials. Compared to that, in the invention, the uniqueness of the structure and its effect are significant. Given this, the essential part of the invention lies in the feature to enhance the bonding strength between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP shell member by interposing an FRP thread member between them. Having the FRP thread member pass through the through holes provided in the metallic outer shell member and then curing the FRP thread member to maintain the shape and thereby hook the metallic outer shell member. The vital point is this hooking effect. It should be considered that the feature of a singular thread passing through multiple through holes is not the essential part. Accordingly, the defendant's product fulfills the first requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Next, please refer to slide 6. The second requirement of the doctrine of equivalence is replaceability. If the purpose of the patented invention can be achieved and identical function and effect can be obtained by replacing this part with a part in the defendant's product. On this point, as is evident from this slide, even in instances where each strip made of FRP only passes through one through hole, these strips will solidly maintain their shape due to the thermosetting of resin. 
and will produce the effect of tightly hooking. As stated regarding the first requirement, given that the defendant's product, where strips made of FRP, that is to say thread like substances, are interposed between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member, and produce the effect of hooking by curing the thread like materials that run along the metallic outer shell member. And given that this enhances the bonding strength between the two shell members, the principle of solving the problem is the same as the invention, and as such produces an identical effect. Please refer to slide 7. I will explain in more detail regarding this point by introducing another embodiment. That differs from the working example described in the patent. Please refer to Figure 1. The FRP outer shell member is indicated in green, the metallic outer shell member in yellow, and the FRP thread member in red, while the adhesive material has been omitted. As you can observe, each of the thread members passes through the multiple through holes. This fulfills all of the claim elements and is included within the technical scope of the invention. For this type of embodiment of the invention, it is conceivable that its strength may be slightly inferior to the embodiment made from a single FRP thread member, such as the one described in the patent. However, due to the curing of the FRP thread member containing epoxy resin, the FRP thread member maintains the shape of hooking the metallic outer shell member on the inner surface. Given this, even if a force to detach the FRP outer shell member is applied, due to the hooking effect, the thread member has sufficient strength and is not pulled out from the through holes. The defendant's product possesses strength that is equivalent or greater than this type of embodiment. Even from that this, it is clear that infringement under the doctrine of equivalence can be found. Furthermore, Fig 2 is a diagram of the defendant's product. Please focus on the hooking section. If you compare them like this, you can observe that the shape of another embodiment bears a close morphological resemblance to the defendant's product. Put simply, the defendant's product has merely segmentized the individual thread members in Fig 1 into two and changed the direction that one of them is facing. As demonstrated, the defendant's product produces the same effect as the invention and thus satisfies the second requirement under the doctrine of equivalence. Please refer to slide 8. The third requirement of the doctrine of equivalence is ease of replacement, namely that the replacement of the structure of the patented invention with that of the defendant's product would have been obvious to a skilled person at the time of making the product, namely at the present time. On this point, the structure whereby the thread passes only once through one through hole cannot be considered particularly difficult or problematic. Accordingly, the defendant's product fulfills the third requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. The defendant does not have any dispute regarding the fulfillment of the fourth requirement, so I shall abbreviate my explanation. Please refer to slide 9. Slide 9 provides an explanation regarding the fifth requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Article 5 means that the defendant's product was intentionally excluded from the scope of rights by the patent applicant, which is not the case. Regarding this fifth requirement, the defendant asserts two pieces of grounds. For the first point, the description in element C, 
namely the thread member running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member, was inserted by the patent applicant as an amendment during the patent prosecution process. The defendant asserts that this amounts to intentionally excluding other embodiments from the scope of rights. However, this amendment was made with the purpose of clarifying an indefinite description in order to resolve the rejection for the violation of clarity requirement pointed out by the patent examiner. Accordingly, it cannot be acknowledged objectively or externally that due to this amendment, some kind of embodiment was excluded from the technical scope. Secondly, the specification states a plurality of thread members 22 may be arranged on the metallic outer shell member at 0015. The defendant asserts that this corresponds to the defendant's product and that it was clearly excluded from the scope of the patent claim. However, this embodiment of plurality of thread members 22 may be arranged involves arranging multiple thread members in parallel, as shown in the diagram in the lower right frame of slide 9. It has nothing to do with the defendant's product. In fact, please refer to diagram 1 of the patent specifications. As a comparative example, the only comparative example deemed not to be included in the invention is the one in the top section only. No through holes, no thread members. The defendant's product has through holes and thread members and on that point is the same as embodiment one in the lower section. Accordingly, the defendant's product also fulfills the fifth requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Therefore, as the defendant's product fulfills all five requirements of the doctrine of equivalence, even if literal infringement is not found, it is clear that infringement under the doctrine of equivalence should be found. This completes the plaintiff's technical briefing. Attorney for the plaintiff, thank you. Next, I would like to hear the presentation from the attorney for the defendant. Next, Sagara Yuriko, the representing defendant, will provide the defendant's technical briefing. Please refer to slide 10. As was explained by the plaintiff, the problem to be solved by the invention, as stated in the description, is enhancing the bonding strength of a metallic outer shell member and an FRP outer shell member which do not have a good adhesive synergy. As a method to resolve this problem, paragraph 0005 in the description states that a plurality of through holes are provided in the bonding portion and by interposing an FRP thread member along with adhesive material between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member, the FRP thread member maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of through holes and running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member the FRP outer shell member is bonded to the metallic outer shell member. Furthermore, in terms of the effect of utilizing such a method, paragraph 0007 of the description states, when a force to detach the FRP outer shell member is applied, the thread member works to fasten the FRP outer shell member to the metallic outer shell member because the thread member maintains the shape of hooking the metallic outer shell member on the surface opposite to the bonding surface. The part shown in the undulating line on this diagram indicates the opposite side to the bonding surface, where the thread member maintains the shape of hooking the metallic outer shell. In other words, it states that even if there is a force applied on the bonding surface side as in the diagram, the thread member is interposed between different through holes, hooking firmly and hence enhancing the bonding strength significantly. 
Please refer to slide 11. In contrast to this, I will explain the nature of the structure of the defendant's product. In the defendant's product, five holes are provided, and while something that corresponds to through holes do exist, the FRP member is not a thread member, but five strips. And furthermore, each of these strips made of FRP only pass through each of the five holes once between the upper surface side of the flange portion of the metallic outer shell and the lower surface side of the flange portion. As such, they do not pass through the plurality of through holes and do not run alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member. Hence, in the defendant's product, An FRP outer shell member is provided on the lower surface of the metallic outer shell member. Element C of the patented invention stipulates an FRP thread member passing alternately through multiple through holes and running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member. And thus, the strips made of FRP that only pass through one hole in the defendant's product do not correspond to FRP thread member. Accordingly, the defendant's product does not satisfy element C. Please refer to slide 12. Although the plaintiff is asserting infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, The structure of the defendant's product does not satisfy the requirements of the doctrine of equivalence. First, regarding requirement 1, the plaintiff appears to assert that producing the effect of hooking is an essential part of the invention, and that a single FRP thread member passing through a plurality of through holes is a non essential part of the invention, and that it is sufficient for a member similar to a thread made from FRP. To pass through one through hole. However, it is clear that the patented invention is an invention conducive to enhancing the bonding strength by passing an FRP thread member through a plurality of through holes and running alternately on the upper surface and the lower surface of the flange portion of the metallic outer shell, thereby hooking the metallic outer shell member on the surface opposite to the bonding surface. In other words, by passing a single FRP thread member through multiple through holes, the portion indicated by the undulating line in the diagram in the slide is formed, and this secure hooking of the metallic outer shell member is in fact the essential part that produces the function and effect of the patented invention. The structure of the defendant's product, where FRP member passes only through one hole, cannot produce the hooking effect. Such as the one of the patented invention, and as such is different in terms of this essential part. Accordingly, the defendant's product does not satisfy the first requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Please refer to slide 13. The plaintiff asserts that the defendant's product has the same objective, function, and effect as the patented invention. However, as stated repeatedly, In the defendant's product, as five strips made of FRP each pass through only one through hole only, they cannot ensure sufficient bonding strength because the strips are unable to tightly hook the metallic outer shell member when a force to detach the FRP outer shell member is applied. Therefore, to secure bonding strength, The defendant's product additionally provides an FRP outer shell member on the lower side of the metallic outer surface. Given that the structure of the defendant's product does not produce the identical function and effect of the patented invention, it is not replaceable. Accordingly, the defendant's product does not satisfy the second requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Furthermore, The plaintiff asserts that it would be easy to replace the structure of the defendant's product. However, it is clear that if five strips made of FRP only pass through one through hole, secure fastening is not possible and sufficient bonding strength cannot be ensured. 
For this reason, the defendant's product provides an FRP outer shell member on the lower outer shell member. And this structure would not be obviously conceived of by a person ordinarily skilled in the art. Therefore, the defendant's product does not satisfy the third requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. Please refer to slide 14. Finally, I will explain the fifth requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. For the patented invention, what was claimed upon filing of the patent application regarding element C was by interposing an FRP thread member along with adhesive material between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member, the FRP thread member maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of through holes. But due to the examiner stating in a notice of reasons for refusal that the structure how the FRP thread member passes through the plurality of through holes is unclear, the plaintiff added the structure of running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member, due to which the patent was issued. This appended portion, in terms of a structure where FRP thread member passes through multiple through holes, clearly limits the various conceivable forms to a structure where one FRP thread member passes through multiple through holes, i.e. running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member and thereby intentionally excludes other forms, such as the structure of the defendant's product. Please refer to slide 15. Supreme Court judgment in 2017 stated that if the applicant is objectively and visibly determined to have indicated his or her intention of omitting statements concerning competing products or processes in the scope of the patent claims in a situation described below, while recognising that the structure for the competing products or processes could substitute for the structure stated in the scope of the patent claims. The applicant knew the existence of such competing products that contain certain parts that are different from the parts in the structure stated in the scope of the patent claims, and the applicant was able to easily conceive the structure, such structure of competing products or processes is deemed as being intentionally excluded from the technical scope of the claim. In this case, the fifth requirement of the doctrine of equivalence is not fulfilled. On this point, paragraph 0015 of the description submitted at the time of patent application states, a plurality of thread members, 22, may be arranged on the metallic outer shell member for bonding. In other words, the patent applicant, the plaintiff, while being cognizant of a structure such as that of the defendant's product, which has multiple thread members made of FRP, did not state this in the scope of claims, and it is objectively and visibly clear that he or she limited the construction to one of running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member, where one singular thread member made of FRP runs through multiple through holes. Therefore, the defendant's product does not satisfy the fifth requirement because the plaintiff intentionally excluded the structure of the defendant's product. Therefore, the defendant's product does not satisfy the fifth requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. This ends the defendant's technical briefing. Thank you, attorney for the defendant. Please refer to slide 16. Next, members of the court will ask questions to both parties. First of all, the judges. First, a question from myself, Judge Sano. Before that, to give some context, I would like to ask Technical Advisor Yamaguchi for an explanation regarding the FRP used in the invention. That is to say the characteristics of fibre-reinforced plastic and epoxy resin. An FRP is known as a composite material made of plastic and fibre with plastic as a matrix. In the FRP used in the invention and the defendant's product, epoxy resin is used as the matrix and carbon fibre is used in the fibre to reinforce the matrix. An FRP can be formed in various shapes. Specifically, the case of the thread members in the invention and the strips in the defendant's product 
it is construed that the epoxy resin in the matrix has two roles. First, maintaining the desired shape of the threads or strips. And second, bonding the FRP outer shell member to the metallic outer shell member. Furthermore, the threads or strips would provide higher bonding strength on the side between the FRP outer shell member and the metallic outer shell member with the assistance of high tensile strength of carbon fibers because the threads or strips are in a state of passing through the plurality of the through holes and hooked on the other side. Thank you, Technical Advisor Yamaguchi. Bearing in mind the explanation of Technical Advisor Yamaguchi, I will now ask a question to both parties. In this case, with regard to the doctrine of equivalence, a major point in dispute is as to whether bonding strength changes depending on whether an FRP thread member goes through only one hole or at least two holes. How do the plaintiff and defendant consider this matter? Thank you. The plaintiff asserts that the bonding strength does not change in either case and that the act of passing through one hole or at least two holes cannot be considered an essential part of the invention and therefore it is possible to have a structure such as the defendant's product where only one hole is passed through and a person skilled in the art could have easily conceived of this fact. The defendant asserts that passing through at least two holes is an essential part of the invention given that only passing through one hole does not produce enough bonding strength in relation to hooking and that it would not be possible to immediately expedite a structure such as the defendant's product where only one hole is passed through. Hence, what it is that a person skilled in the art would easily conceive of would be providing an FRP lower outer shell to make up for insufficient bonding strength. This point is very complicated, and as I consider it to be a crucial point of issue, I have created a slide to organize the points at issue. Please refer to slide 17. My question is based on slide 17. In this slide, figure one shows the structure of another example of the invention alleged by the plaintiff, and figure two indicates the structure of the defendant's product with the FRP lower outer shell removed. When comparing these two structures, is there any difference in the bonding strength between the FRP outer shell member and the metallic outer shell member? I would like to direct the, this question to both parties. If you focus on each of the areas wedged between two through holes on the metallic outer shell member, for the invention in figure one, it is not the case that the hooking effect is being obtained by the thread member regarding all of these areas. And it is clear that the hooking effect is only being obtained in every other area. Conversely, in figure two, the hooking effect by the thread member is without exception obtained for all of the areas wedged between two through holes. Hypothetically speaking, even if this were not the case, in both figure one and figure two, the size of the surface area where the red thread member or strips adjoins the green FRP outer shell member is the same, and it can be construed that the bonding strength is equal. That is to say, as in figure 1, the red FRP thread member adjoins the green FRP outer shell member in two places. On the other hand, in figure 2, the red strips made of FRP adjoin the green FRP outer shell member in five places. And I think that the size of the adjoining surface area is the same in both figures. The defendant's product has achieved a higher mechanical intensity than the structure in figure 2 by adding an FRP lower outer shell member. But by adding surplus construction in this way, infringement under the doctrine of equivalence cannot be evaded.
I will explain as attorney of the defendant. Each of the individual strips in figure 2 of slide 17 only pass through one through hole and are only hooking in one place. And so I believe that the bonding strength in figure 2 is clearly inferior to that of figure 1. As I have previously asserted, in the actual defendant's product, a structure with an FRP lower outer member is essential to secure sufficient bonding strength. It cannot be asserted that such a structure that individual strips made of FRP only pass through a single through hole could be replaced to the structure of the invention or that enhancing the bonding strength by providing an FRP lower outer shell member is something that would be easy to be replaced. On the issue of bonding strength, it would seem that there are some inconsistent viewpoints between the parties, so I would like to ask technical advisor Nakajima to provide an explanation on this point from a professional point of view. Generally speaking, the size of the contact area of the red thread members or strips on the figure in slide 17 and the green FRP outer shell member is a very important element for determining strength. Regarding the hooking also, in terms of the impact on strength, it is important to evaluate in considering the relevant bonding portion in their entirety. Essentially, bonding strength can change depending on the number and interval of holes, shape of the thread member and precision of construction, etc. So, I do not believe it is possible to determine which is weaker or stronger merely by comparing the bonding strength in figure 1 and figure 2 in slide 17. Thank you very much. Next, Judge Kumagai and myself would like to ask the plaintiff to confirm the process by which the amendment was made that the defendant pointed out. With regard to the element of maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of through holes, in claims attached to the application, a notice for reasons for refusal was received. The reasons of refusal notified to the effect that the invention was unclear as to the form where a thread member passes through multiple through holes. In order to clarify this, an amendment was made to the effect of maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of through holes and running alternately on inner and outer surfaces of the metallic outer shell member. That is to say, the plaintiff is not objectively regarded as having excluded any form included in the initial claims from the technical scope of the invention through the amendment. Thank you. Finally, I would like to ask a question to the defendant. If one was to use a single thread member instead of the strips in the defendant's product, manufacturing would be easier, and I believe the manufacturing cost would be lower. Given this, why did you decide to have multiple strips? Using strips saves more time than stitching thread, so using strips does not make manufacturing more difficult, and thus the manufacturing costs cannot be simply compared. The defendant used the strips from the comprehensive perspective that they would be optimal for the structure of the defendant's product. Thank you. Are there any questions from the judicial research official? I have a question for the defendant. What is the reason for having a double-layered structure in the defendant's product where the edge of the FRP outer shell member has a lower outer shell member and an upper outer shell member? As I explained previously, the principal reason is functional, namely to reinforce the weakness of the bonding strength that is caused by the FRP strips only passing through one through hole. The other reason was a manufacturing one, namely that the lower outer shell member makes it easy to decide where to position the strips made of FRP. Any other questions? This brings today's explanatory session to a close. I would like to thank both attorneys for their time today. And both sides have exhaustively provided assertions and submitted evidence regarding infringement, 
So the court will hold discussions and will disclose its preliminary view on infringement at the next hearing. Is this acceptable? Yes. Yes. Can we schedule the next hearing at two o'clock on July 29th? Yes. Yes. Please refer to slide 18. In the ensuing proceedings, the panel explained to both parties that while the defendant's product does not constitute literal infringement of element C of the invention, the defendant's product can be construed to fall within the technical scope of the invention under the doctrine of equivalence. And as such, the panel recommended both parties to resolve the case through settlement. In response to this, the plaintiff expressed the intention that as the defendant is still selling the defendant's product, it must promptly cease from doing so, and also that the plaintiff hopes for settlement. However, the defendant indicated that it would be difficult to immediately proceed with a reconciliation settlement on the basis of the preliminary view that the sale of the defendant's product infringes the patent rights of the plaintiff. Hence, the court explained that it would be unfeasible to proceed immediately with a reconciliation settlement and that proceedings would be conducted on the amount of damage. Subsequently, discussion about the amount of damage incurred was conducted at the third to fifth dates for oral argument and oral arguments were concluded on the fifth date. Please refer to slide 19. I will now render our judgment. Paragraph 1 of main text. The defendant shall not manufacture or sell the product in the list appended to this judgment. Paragraph 2. The defendant shall dispose of the product in the list appended to this judgment. Paragraph 3. The defendant shall pay the plaintiff 500 million yen in delinquency charges at the annual rate of 5% from December 13, 2019 to the date of full payment. Paragraph 4. The defendant shall bear the court costs. Paragraph 5. This judgment may be provisionally enforced as far as paragraphs 1 and 3 are concerned. The reasons for this judgment are provided in the judgment document. I will now briefly explain the summary of the judgment. Firstly, I would like to come right to the point. Although the defendant's product does not literally fulfill element C of the invention, it falls within the technical scope of the invention by having a structure equivalent to that of the invention. Therefore, the court renders the judgment that the manufacturer and sale of the defendant's product constitutes infringement of the patents of the invention. Next, I will explain the outcome for literal infringement. The FRP thread member in element C means an FRP thread member that passes through the plurality of through holes provided in the bonding portion of the metallic outer shell member. It does not include an FRP thread member that only passes through one through hole. Furthermore, each of the multiple strips in the defendant's products only pass through one through hole and so cannot be regarded as the FRP thread member in element C. As such, it does not constitute literal infringement. The panel recognised the establishment of infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, so I will now outline our judgement. Even if the structure described in the scope of the claims has an aspect or part which is different from an aspect part of the accused product or method, if the following five requirements are fulfilled, the accused product or method can be construed as being equivalent to the structure described in the scope of the claim of the patented invention and as falling within the technical scope of the invention. This is infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. The five requirements are as follows. First, the different part is not the essential part of the patented invention. 
Second, the purpose of the patented invention can be achieved and identical function and effect can be obtained even if replacing the different part of the patented invention with a part in the accused product, replaceability. Third, a person ordinarily skilled in the art could easily come up with the idea of such replacement at the time of the production of the accused product. Easiness to replace. Fourth, the accused product is not identical to the technology in the public domain at the time of the application of the patented invention or could not easily be conceived of by such a person at the time. Fifth, there were no special circumstances such as the fact that the accused product falls within those products that had been intentionally excluded from the scope of the patent claim in the patent application process. First, I will outline the opinion of the panel on the first requirement. Given the description in the specification and evidence, the characteristic feature of the invention can be regarded as the interposing of an FRP thread member between the FRP outer shell member and the metallic outer shell member in order to enhance the bonding strength between the two different materials, whereby the FRP thread member bonds securely with the FRP outer shell member and hardens upon heating. Furthermore, the invention can also be characterized in terms of the feature to enhance the bonding strength between the metallic outer shell member and the FRP outer shell member by having the FRP thread member pass through the through holes provided in the metallic outer shell member and then curing the FRP thread member to maintain the shape and thereby hook the metallic outer shell member. Accordingly, the essential part of the invention shall lie in the interposing of an FRP thread between the FRP outer shell member and the metallic outer shell member and hooking the metallic outer shell by the FRP thread member passing through the through holes provided in the metallic outer shell. If the invention changes its structure such that the FRP thread member only passes through a single through hole, it does not change the fact that the FRP thread member is interposed between the FRP shell member and the metallic outer shell member, thereby hooking the metallic outer shell member. And thus, in terms of producing the effect of the invention, it is not important whether the FRP thread member passes through multiple through holes or only a single through hole provided in the metallic outer shell member. Accordingly, the feature of the FRP thread member passing through multiple through holes provided in the metallic outer shell member cannot be found to be an essential part of the invention. In the defendant's product, each of multiple strips corresponding to an FRP thread member, which is interposed between the upper FRB outer shell member and the metallic outer shell member, passes through a single through hole provided in the metallic outer shell member. Then, heat is applied to harden the strips so that they tightly bond the metallic outer shell member, and the FRP outer shell member and each of those strips hooks the metallic outer shell member. In this manner, the defendant's product fulfills the first requirement of infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. I will now explain regarding the second and third requirements. Regarding the second requirement, as I explained regarding the first requirement, even if the invention changes its structure such that the FRP thread member only passes through a single through hole, it still produces the function and effect of enhancing the bonding strength between the FRP outer thread member and the metallic outer shell, and thus replaceability can be recognized. As such, the defendant's product fulfills the second requirement of infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. Turning to the third requirement, 
Although the defendant's product is different from the structure of the invention in that each of the multiple strips only passes through one through-hole provided in the metallic outer shell member, it can be deemed as being a commonplace structure producing the same effect as the invention. And a person ordinarily skilled in the art could easily have conceived of replacing the structure in the invention with the structure in the defendant's product. As such, the defendant's product fulfills the third requirement for infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. As there is no dispute between the parties with regard to the fulfillment of the fourth requirement in this case, I will finally explain regarding the fifth requirement. Since the amendment made by the plaintiff was merely intended to clarify unclear descriptions of element C, FRP thread member maintaining a shape of passing through the plurality of the through holes, it cannot be regarded as narrowing the technical scope of the claim through this amendment. Furthermore, Paragraph 0015 of the specification does not describe a structure such as that of the defendant's product, and the plaintiff cannot be construed as having intentionally excluded the structure such as that of the defendant's product from the technical scope of the invention. As such, the defendant's product also fulfills the fifth requirement of infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. This concludes the summary of the judgment. With this, the mock trial is concluded. Thank you for your attention.